Howdy. Let's go. Let's go. It's great to be here. Let me just say this up front. You guys have, I I think, probably the best volunteer team in in the entire country. Okay, it's amazing. It, it is. It is amazing. It's always. It's always humbling just to come here, man. I, when I was, I, I would come to uh, College Station. I was lost. You know, I was. I was trying to find God and figure out who He is and what He wanted from me. And just, I, I just made mistakes in the city that I would regret the rest of my life. And so it's always just. It's. It's amazing to get to to worship. Uh, with you. I, I have a wife. We've been married 18 years. We have three kids. And uh, we moved from Dallas, I guess four years ago, we moved from Dallas to Waco, Texas, moved south. And, uh, and we love Waco. We love Waco a ton. But if you want to join me in praying that my three kids would go to Texas A&M, uh, I, I, won't be, I, I, won't be, I won't be mad at you. And so everybody has different gifts. Like everybody in here has different gifts. It's like the Lord was, was divvying up gifts. Like one gift that he did not give me was, was a sense of direction. Okay, like I get lost in my neighborhood. Like I just, I, I'm not very good at like which way is north and south and all the things and how to get home and whatnot. And, and so anybody here like struggle with a sense of direction? Yeah, okay. Like I'm an early uh, adopter of the GPS, the navigation system. You know, I, I use uh, Google Maps, sometimes Waze, you know, and, and if I'm desperate, Apple Maps. And so just like big on, on the technology and, and not true, like my wife, she's amazing. Like she knows, like you can take her, on, you know, out in the country on the side of the road, blindfold her, spin her around, and she'll be able to tell you exactly how to get home. This is a game we play some Saturday nights, you know. I mean, she's just really good with, not really, that's not true, really good with directions. But the other day I land at DFW, which is the airport outside, you know, Dallas-Fort Worth, and I'm, I'm coming back from Atlanta, and I, I need to go home. And I just got a new car. What's well, a used car, new to me kind of car. And the car has this feature where you can just hit the home button. Like you just push home and it tells you how to get home. And so I'm there at the airport. I, I finally, you know, get to the car in, in the parking lot and I, I, I push home because I want to go home. I miss my family. I'm going to see the fam. I've been gone. For, it's like, let's go home. I push home and I just do everything it says. And it takes me from the DFW airport into Dallas, which is weird because it's never done that before. But I'm like, maybe it senses traffic. Like it's good like that. You know, it knows where the traffic is and stuff. And so I'm thinking maybe it's kind of routing me around traffic. So I drive, you know, 30 miles to Dallas and, and, and then it takes me through Dallas to East Dallas, which I'm like weird because I got, I don't know. It doesn't seem like Waco's this direction. And, and, and then it has me turn north. And I'm like, but I'm pretty sure I live south. And so now at this point, like I pull over to the side of the road because I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Well, it turns out that somehow it had reverted back to the previous owner's address who lives up north somewhere. And so it was taking me to his house. And so I had to kind of figure that out. But before I should follow it, I need to make sure it's set on this, the right destination. Before I should do what it says, I need to make sure that, that the GPS, the navigation system, is calibrated to the right destination. And I start there because I want you to know your heart works the same way. Your heart works the same way. And there's all this confusion uh, around the heart. Can you trust it? Jesus, when you trust in Christ, his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins, his Holy Spirit comes into your life and he gives you a new heart. Can you trust it? Maybe you've heard Jeremiah says the heart is wicked and deceitful beyond cure. Who can know it? But in the New Testament, it says we're to follow God's law from our heart. So I'm confused. Can I trust my heart? Well, the Holy Spirit does give you a new heart indeed. You still have a flesh. You still have an old self. You still have a degenerate or old heart that is going to try and lead you astray. So before you follow your heart, you can write this down, before you follow your heart, you must inform your heart. Before you do what your heart says, you must tell it where to go. You must fill it with the right things. 
It doesn't seem like a big deal, but here's what I tell you about your generation. You're the most anxious generation that has ever lived in the United States of America. You're the most depressed generation that has ever lived in the United States of America. You're the most suicidal generation that has ever lived in the United States of America. And everybody's like, oh man, it's so true. What's going on? Like, what do we do? I don't know. I'm really anxious. I can't sleep. I've got these issues. Going back to the therapist, what do I do? And I'm like, man, I kind of think it's your phone. Hmm. Well, I really want my phone, so I guess I'll just be anxious too. I'd rather be anxious than lose my phone. I'd rather not sleep than, and, and we're stuck in this conundrum of like, all right, what is going on? And I'm gonna read to you from an ancient text, thousands and thousands and thousands of years uh, year old. And some of you, if you've been in church long, you've heard it, but I don't think we understand it. Because the scripture doesn't say to follow your heart. The scripture says that you are to guard your heart. You ever heard that before, guard your heart? Yeah, like, like when you were 15 at a lock-in, you know? Uh, you know, some dude like me is telling all the girls, ladies, guard your heart. And, and you're like, I don't know how. <laughs> and, and you're just as confused as he is or she is. But the scripture actually tells us how. And so from the scripture, I'm gonna, before you leave tonight, you're going to know how to guard your heart. The question for you is, do you need to take the command seriously? And I'm just telling you, if you don't, you're gonna end up in a place you don't wanna be. You're gonna follow it into divorce. You're gonna follow it into a dead-end relationship. You're gonna follow it into bankruptcy. You're gonna follow it into anxiety. You're gonna follow it into depression. But if you can learn how to guard your heart, you're going to find a life that is worth living. Surrender to the Holy Spirit, uh, led by Jesus Christ, yielded to God, a, a life of joy and peace and love and self-discipline. If the Holy Spirit would allow me to effectively communicate to you how to guard your heart. I, I was going to show you all of the songs and all of the movies and everything that says that you should follow your heart, that you should trust your feelings. Candidly, there was too many. We'd be here all night, right? Selena Gomez tells you the heart wants what it wants. It wants what it wants. It's cute. <laughs> My heart wants to kill me sometimes. I mean, can you trust it? Like, think about it. Have you ever been in a relationship with someone that you are absolutely crazy about that you're no longer in? You couldn't trust it then. Like people, some of the most confused people I ever meet with are, are those in the wake of a breakup. And they're like asking things like, why would God give me all these feelings and if he's not the right one? Why did he lead me to this place where it just seems like he went to church and owned a Bible and everything? Why would he do that? This proverb wasn't written for the 15-year-old girl at a lock-in. It was actually written from a father to, as instructions to his son. The, the first nine chapters of the Proverbs are, are actually made up of 10 lectures. Uh, Proverbs chapter 4, that's where I'm going to be if you want to turn there, it is no exception. I, I see some of you brought a pen and a piece of paper. Thank you. This is a note-taker's message. You're going to want to take notes because I'm going to give you five questions in the how to guard your heart. Who, what, where, when, why. Who, what, where, when, why are, are five questions from the text that you can, if you effectively ask yourself in your small group, when you meet with your friends, if you ask yourself these questions for the rest of your life, you will learn how to effectively guard your heart and find the life that God, that Jesus Christ has for you. This was written by the wisest man who's ever lived, King Solomon, the wealthiest man who has ever lived. We typically talk about this verse in the context of relationships, which is really applicable for some of you, because some of you, you spend more time with your significant other right now in college than I do with my wife. 
And I spend a lot of time with my wife. I mean, we have dinner most nights together. We sleep in the same bed most nights together, unless I'm traveling, right? Most nights, uh, we're under the same roof most days, uh, all weekends. Like, we spend a lot of time together. And some of you spend more time with your significant other than I do my wife, my, the, the mother of my three children. And you're like, I know the scriptures that guard your heart, but I don't know what that means. Let's watch a movie. Let's hang out. Here's my heart on a silver platter. I love you. And you play marriage. You play married and you date in a way that we were never made to. We were never meant to. And, and some of you, you hear me and you're not going to change. You don't think I know what I'm talking about. And I don't. I'm just a dude that's seen tens of thousands of dating relationships. Done more weddings than I know how to count. Hum humbly, and I mean this, I, I had the privilege and honor of writing a book on, on relationships. I spent, you know, the last 10 years studying your generation. But you do you. Proverbs 4, verse 20. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. This is the, hey, listen up. Eyes on me. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. He's going to warn you that you need to guard your heart. Be careful what you let in. But he starts right here. He says, make sure you let this in. Open your heart to this truth. For they are life. Or he says, do not let them out of your sight. Keep them in your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. The stakes are high. Life and death, health or sickness, uh, uh, peace or anxiety. That's what's at stake. Listen to what I'm saying. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Your version might say, keep your heart with all vigilance. The keep there is like the way you want to keep the milk. You want to keep it from going bad. You want to keep it from turning rotten. What that means is there are people with rotten hearts. Their, their hearts have gone bad. You ever date, don't raise your hand, but have you ever dated someone whose heart was rotten? If you think about it, it's like, oh yeah, maybe that's what was wrong. Their heart spoiled. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the past for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. Two key observations from this text before we dive in further is, is your heart stores information. And it determines what you put in that storage container determines what comes out of your life. That's what he says. Everything you do flows from it. And it says you're to guard it more than you guard anything. Second observation, you guard it more than you guard anything. So my first point this evening, before I dive into those five questions, who, what, where, when, why, is what does it mean to guard your heart? And to answer it really clearly for you, it means you be careful what you allow in. Do you think about this enough? The term Guard your heart. It's a military term. It, it's a, it's, it's the, the term that you would use for a soldier in front of a castle who's protecting the castle with violence and hostility and willing to use force against anyone or anything that would come against the castle. He says, above all else. Listen, this is the 66 books of the Bible. He could have said, hey, above all else, you know, guard your stereo. Above all else, guard your jewelry. Above all else, guard your money because it's valuable. Above all else, guard your family. Above all else, guard your relationship. He says, but more than you guard anything in this world, you protect your heart. Do you think about that enough? More than you guard anything. And man, you be careful what you let in your heart. And so you're like, maybe you're like, okay, I want to. How do I do that? You experience life through your five senses. Okay? You know, you, you know the five senses from health class, you know, sight, hear, taste, smell, touch. This is how you, you take things in. 
You, you experience the five senses. Those things feed your mind, which feeds your heart, which feeds your life. Let me show you. I've got some, some slides. So we've got the five senses. Like this is like when you're in a situation where you're, oh, that, you're like, oh, that smell, that smells like my mom's cook. Man, that takes me back to that perfume smells like my ex-girlfriend. Oh, I remember. Oh, that's, oh, this song, man. I danced to this song in the eighth grade, baby. Bye, bye, bye. You know, I, I'm back there. I'm back, I'm back. Man, I remember that. These things, it take, oh, I stored that up. You stored it up through the five senses, you received it, and you stored it up where? Your mind. What's the difference between your mind and the heart? Now, let me say this. When I talk about the heart, I'm not talking about the organ. I'm not talking about the thing that pumps blood. In the Bible, in the scripture, it's your emotional quotient. It's the feelings that make you you. It's the way you feel. The mind stores your thoughts, the heart stores your feelings. But you take in the five senses, you take in the surroundings, those five senses feed your mind. We'll go back to the slide. So the five senses feed your mind. You store those memories in your mind. And what you think, what goes in your mind, feeds your heart. And that's what determines how you feel when, when this goes into the heart and then everything you do flows from it, which impacts your life, which is the next little stick man guy. That's what flows out of your life. So you experience something, you think about it, you think about it affects how you feel and how you feel determines your outlook and everything you do. You feel bad, life's not good. You feel great, you feel joy, life is good. How did you get to those feelings? You experienced something and you thought about it. And this is what he's saying. Hey, be careful. Be careful what you let in your heart because everything flows from it. That, that gra- those graphics might help some of you that think that way. I'll tell you a story that might help the rest of you. Okay, a parable, if you will. Um, There was a shepherd boy who's trying to give water to his sheep, and there's a stream. The stream flows down the mountain, and and it's there, and he's he's getting water for his sheep, but the, the water's filthy. It's full of dirt and debris and feces and all kinds of nasty, so he has to filter it. So he gets it in a big jug, and he, and he lets all of the sediment, all of the, the dirt settle to the bottom, and then he carefully pours it into a filter trying to get clean water, and a wise man walks upon the shepherd and says, what are you doing? And he goes, well, I have to, the water's so dirty in the stream, I have to to filter it so that my sheep will drink it. They won't drink it unless I clean it. And the, sh- the wise man says to the shepherd, there is an easier way. And the shepherd says, please tell me, what, what is it? And he goes, follow me. And he takes him up the mountain to the mouth of the spring that feeds the stream. And there on the mouth of the spring, all of this livestock has stepped in it and trampled and turned up the dirt and the mud and they've relieved themselves in this kind of tank, this pool of water. And the wise man says to the shepherd, if we can protect the mouth of this spring, then what flows from it will be clean. He says, we just need to build a fence around the mouth of the spring that feeds the stream. And if you do, then everything that flows from it will be clean. And this is what the author of Proverbs 4 is saying to you. If you can learn to protect what goes in your heart, then everything that flows from your life will be clean. And so how do we do it? I'm going to give you five questions. Who, what, where, when, and why. Great questions to ask your life group. First, who are you listening to? Who are you listening to from the scripture verse 20 my son pay attention to what I say turn your ear to my words do not let them out of your sight keep them within your heart you have feedback bias so when you begin to go through deconstruction and you start to question things you have thoughts and you begin to read books and listen to podcasts that feed those thoughts and those thoughts grow. So you had an idea that becomes a belief which becomes a conviction. It may not be true, you just fed it and it grew. You might listen to heresy and those heretics feed ideas that become strongholds in your life. 
The conversation that I've had countless times, I step off the stage, young lady comes up to me, she says, hey, JP, I need your help, I only date losers. I don't know what it is, I just like guys that aren't good for me. I, I wanna find a good, strong Christian man, but I just keep dating these losers. And I say, well, who are you listening to? She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, who's in your Spotify? You know, Apple Music, who are you listening to? She goes, no, I'm talking about dating. Like, I get it, who you listen to? What's your favorite songs right now? I said, I don't know. I, I don't know, man. I mean, you, you heard the new Taylor album? That's good, like Antihero, what's up? I guess, you know. I'm like, oh, you, you want a marriage like Taylor? I don't, I mean, uh, you heard the new Miley Cyrus, you know? I can buy myself flowers. You heard, you heard that? Oh, you want a marriage like Miley? She just went through a divorce. He cheated on her with 14 different women. True story. You want that? You, that's what you're looking for? I, I mean, no disrespect. Sounds like she only dates losers. That's what you, that's what you, oh, man, you know, you sound like my grandma. No, I sound like the wisest man who's ever lived. Written by the Holy Spirit. Oh, you, you thought that stuff doesn't impact you. Oh, you thought Nicki Minaj didn't tell you. You thought Lil Uzi. You thought Post Malone and Doja Cat. You thought, oh, you, oh, you, you're, they're gonna, that's who's gonna tell you who to date. Really, how's that going for you? How's that working out? It doesn't have to be just dating. Like some of you are obsessed with sports. You know, it's sports radio. You listen to it and your emotions, why the wave of your favorite team, some men in their ball and the scoreboard, you know, or you gossip. Can't wait to hear the next gossip. What are you saying, number two? What are you saying? What comes out of your mouth? 24, verse 24, keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. You think, does what we say really impact our heart? Maybe more than anything else you do. It certainly displays what's in your heart. If you don't trust me, I think we're all, like most of us here are Christians, Christians, like Jesus Christ followers. Let me just go words of Jesus, Matthew 15. But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For, what, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. I really like him. But sometimes he makes inappropriate jokes. It's because his heart's messed up. Do you gossip? You talk about someone who's not present. You call yourself a Jesus follower and talk about somebody who's not there, forming other people's opinion. See, at our church, what we do is we practice something called the 24-hour principle, which is if you say something to me about someone who's not present, I simply tell you, hey, you have 24 hours to tell them because you told me and that's not helpful. You told me something about them and that's not how, what it does is it makes Harris Creek really unsafe for gossip. We talk a lot about safe space. Harris Creek is so unsafe for gossip. Gossip's not safe there. You, you should do everything you can to make Texas A&M unsafe for gossip. We don't talk about people who aren't present. We talk to people, not about people. What comes out of your mouth? I think sometimes we think the occasional cuss word is cute, it's just a word, it's just a sound. What really makes it bad? Your heart makes it bad. Ephesians 4.29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up so that it may benefit those who listen. What unwholesome talk can I let? Do not let any unwholesome talk, but only what is, so I'm only supposed to speak what builds people up and encouragement? Man, if you ever met that person, you want to be their friend. 
they have a good life. The person that only speaks words of encouragement, that's a good person with a good heart. Number three, where are you looking? Where are you looking? Verse 25, let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Where are you looking? Man, I get caught on that explore page on Instagram. Man, it trips me up. And I'll, I'll be scrolling. And I used to like be big. I used to like love the UFC and stuff, you know, and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and all that. And so I'm a sucker for like a good punch video. Like somebody just gets knocked out cold. I know I'm a pastor. Don't judge me. But it, it just is like I can't. It's like I'm scrolling and I see that. And I'm like, oh, oh, gosh, wow, you know. And I, I, I had to stop watching UFC for the same reason because I feed my heart that stuff, man. And I like some, you know, somebody pops off to me and I'm sitting, you know, they say something crazy like your sermon, you went long and it was terrible and I hate you. You know, and I'm like, man, I bet if I hit you right here, you're out, you know. And I'm like, oh, I gotta stop that, you know, don't think that, right? And I'm like, where did that come from? Oh, yeah, that social media clip. Oh, that's, that's where they come from. Watch what you set on your, you know, set before your eyes. Far too often we're entertained by the things Jesus died for. Some people, like it's like forensic files or true crime or snapped or, you know, the crime shows or serial podcasts or the Idaho murderer. You know, you're watching it and and like I heard something the other day, I overheard it was on playing at my in-laws' house, and it says, you know, he he was obsessed, the murderer was obsessed with watching these crime shows, and he went from watching the crime shows to committing his own crime. You look at the Idaho murder, a similar deal, like obsessed with criminology and crimes, and it's like, wait, hold on. Is that really what happened? Yeah. That's why he says, above all else, more than you guard anything. Guard your heart. It's crazy how this stuff works, man. Your heart, it's like your iPhone. You know what I mean? Like it's always listening. You ever notice that? It's like, you're like, man, I, I really want a new rug. It's like, you want a rug? Here's a rug. Wayfair's got rugs. Overstock's got rugs. Even Amazon has rugs. You're like, whoa, how did Amazon know I was looking for a rug? Because it's listening heart works the same way you know it's like oh you like the office check out suits check out this show check out this show it's just like the office. oh you like to check this out it's always trying to give you more it works like a bloodhound it wants to give you more of what you feed it the heart doesn't want what it wants the heart wants what it's fed the heart doesn't want what it wants it wants what it is fed that's how your heart works. You know, I watch Shark Tank. I love Shark Tank. Love it, man. My favorite, best show on TV, in my humble opinion. But then I'm like driving down the road. I was like, I bet I, you know, I think I invented that first. Like they stole that idea from me. Man, I should have got the patent. And I'm going to invent this over here. I'm going to come up with some laundry detergent or something. Like it's like I, I'm going to go on the show. I start thinking that way. I feel my, my heart with that or my head. Yeah. In my head, starts my head, goes down in my heart. I'm like, I watch Fixer Upper. Shout out Waco. Like love Chip and Joe. I'm watching Fixer Upper. I'm like, baby, Monica, we, we need to get a new house. You know, she's like, we just built a new house. I'm like, yeah, we need to buy an old house. You know, and fix it up. Like we, need to, we need to sell this house and get an old house so we can fix up the old house. Maybe you like the summer I turned pretty. Oh, did he go there? No, don't ruin my show, you know. And you're like, why is there so much drama in my life? Pure in heart will set no evil thing before their eyes. We're not even talking about explicit things. But when it's explicit things, you have no idea how bad your, your struggle with porn is messing you up. It's costing you your marriage before you ever met your spouse. 
making your kids hate you a decade before they're born. Have no idea what you're doing. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just a guy who's counseled hundreds of people through pornography addiction and has been completely and utterly enslaved to it myself. I think if you, above all else, what do you want me to do, get rid of my phone? Of course. Yeah. Sure. Why not? Above all else, guard your heart for what you put in it flows out of your life. What happens if I feed it porn? Why is the divorce rate so high? Why, why are marriages declining? Why are people getting married later and less? What happens if I feed it porn? Why do I objectify the opposite sex? Why am I having these intrusive thoughts of same-sex attraction? What happens if I feed it porn? Why, when I'm on the elevator, do I wonder about their... happens if I feed it porn. Number four, when do you plan your path? When do you plan your path? Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. By planning your path, I mean when do you set aside time to fill your heart with the things of God, that your quiet time isn't just a method of obedience, but a means to survival, that you would start your day reflecting upon the things of God, not just so that you're doing what you're supposed to do and you can tell your small group something, but so that you can resist the enemy's attack by reflecting on what is true so that you know where to go and you set the destination on the right place. When do you plan your path? Listen, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago, if you are struggling with anxiety or depression and you go and see a therapist, you're going to leave with a prescription for what's called an SSRI. Stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptick Inhibitor. Okay, I'm not saying anything about medication. It can be extremely helpful to some people. But today, if you go and see a therapist, more than likely, you're going to leave with some instruction that's going to look a lot like prayer. And what I mean by that is they're going to tell you, hey, you, cognitive behavioral therapy, you should begin to reflect and meditate and be still and listen and, and fill your mind with positive thoughts. Like Paul says, set your mind on the things above. Renew your mind. Meditate. Sit still. Think about God. Fill your, your heart with optimism. <laughs> That's what your secular atheist scientist therapist is going to tell you. And I turn to a couple thousand years ago, a few thousand years ago, and see David say, I meditate on your law day and night. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, if anything, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent, think about these things. Philippians 4.8. Bible, man, it's on to something. I was, I was in Atlanta recently, and the, the guy I was driving around with just said, prayer healed me. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, not that my prayer was answered, but just the activity. I was struggling with anxiety so bad. Just the activity of long, contemplative prayer every morning actually healed me. I'm not trying to make light of your mental illness or struggle, not at all. I'm giving you an option to consider. And I don't mean just prayer, I mean see a therapist. 
Look into cognitive behavioral therapy. Test what I'm saying. Number five, why do you stray? Why do you stray? Which is really to say, like, how would the enemy take you out? If he's going to take you out, what's he going to use against you? I've been giving people the same advice for a long time. If you're stuck, if you're struggling, change your playmates in your playground. Change your playmates in your playground. Change who you hang out with and, and what you do, and you'll be fine. Change your playmates in your playground. Do not turn to the right or the left or keep your foot from evil. If something seems evil, stay away from it. Don't puck it, poke it or anything like that. I, I, I'm amazed at how your generation is like obsessed with crystals and manifesting and horoscopes. All that stuff is satanic. Like it's not like a little bit. But it's like, oh man, maybe it's God, you know, in the manifesting. No, no, no. It's Satan and demons. But it works. Of course it works. Sometimes. Whatever they got to do to get you. No, that's demonic stuff, man. That's, that's not, like, it's like the opposite. It's evil. Like, if you're like, oh, I didn't know. I, I wasn't sure. No, well, now, you know, God in his kindness to you has you here tonight. It's evil. It is only wicked. Not any of it is any way kind, uh, any kind of way redemptive. Just wicked. What goes in your heart determines what comes out of your life. Let me just go real, like, firsthand with you. Okay, so uh, I, ha- I struggle with porn for, like, since the fifth grade, uh, through college, into becoming uh, a Christian, okay, like, like, like bad. Like, we're calling sick to work to look at porn. Like, really bad. Sexual addiction, th- that was there, too. And so now I'm a Christian, so I have to be really careful about what I set before my eyes because that, that like, that, all that stuff's up here. And, yeah, it's fading as, as the longer I live. Like, it's going away. And whatnot, but it's still, it's like back there in files and whatnot. And so what I feel like, the enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion. Like if there's a door right here and all my lustful temptation is on the other side of that door, like Satan's on the other side of the door, the lion wants to rip me to, to shreds. I lock the door, deadbolt the door, put the chain there. And I got like my back against it like this, right? I'm, I'm like holding the door. Well, I, there's a type of show that I love. And it's like the born identity, kind of born supremacy, like, like somebody, they're really good at what they do. You know, they're like the, a military soldier. I love those kinds of shows. So somebody's like, hey, you should watch Terminal List, um, Reacher, Jack Ryan. They're great. I'm like, oh, man. So I'm watching Terminal List. And man, they're right. Like, this is exactly the kind of show that I like. Well, I'm watching Terminal List, and it's great, and I'm into it. Well, all of a sudden, they're like, boom, there's a, a strip club scene. Boom, like right there. It's on the TV. Like, whoa. But I saw, like, I saw it. And what that felt like in that moment, like just seeing that strip club scene for that long, Right? What it felt like is I walked to that door, unlocked, moved the chain, moved the deadbolt, turned the knob, cracked it open. Come and get me. Right? So then I'm walking around, and all of a sudden, second looks. I'm like, my heart's messed up. I, I tell my guys, I'm like, hey, I, I, it's, the attack is heightened. I've got to delete Instagram off my phone right now. Hey, you guys, pray for me. How'd you get there, Ambassador? Sec, two seconds on the TV. Like some of you, you're feeding your heart that all the time. You're like, man, I don't know. Why am I down? I know why you're down. Why, why can't I stop objectifying women? Oh, I know. Why do I feel so perverted? I know. It's not a mystery. It's not confusing above all else. Guard your heart. The pure in heart eliminate evil from their lives at all cost. In summary, be very careful what you let in your heart. Ask these five questions. Who are you listening to? What are you saying? Where are you looking? When do you plan your path? Why do you stray? King Solomon who wrote this verse did not take his own advice. Like, it's like you being at breakaway, nodding your heads, taking notes, and then going back like a dog to his vomit. He didn't take, when he got older in his life, he had all of these wives and these these prostitutes. And, And it says in 
1 Kings 11, as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as heart of David his father had been. And we know in Ecclesiastes that Solomon died deeply depressed, despairing. He died in dark, dark, dark. The man who had more money than any person who has ever lived more pleasure than any person who has ever lived, the wisest person to ever live other than Jesus died deeply depressed because he didn't guard his heart. He's not your example to follow. Jesus, on the other hand, Jesus, it says in Hebrews, was tempted in every way but did not sin. He was tempted in all the ways that you're tempted, but he did not sin. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, There's joy in him even dying for your sins so that you don't have to pay for your sins. And it says, so what's our response? Let us throw off the sin that so easily entangles us and run the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who endured the cross, scorning its shame. You know, when you have a GPS, it remembers where you want to go. It wants to take you back to, you know, wherever, I don't even know, the chicken or (laughs) Hurricane Harry's, is that still a thing? Like it wants to, it, it was like, hey, come back, drink specials, Tuesday nights, let's go. It wants to take you back there, it knows the address. Hey, let's go back to her apartment. Let's go back to the frat party, let's go back to that sorority party, let's go back. It wants to take you there, it's ready to go. But when you stop going to those places, it will remember for a little while. But when you begin to replace them with new places, no, man, let's go read Arena. Tuesday night, let's go, that, let's go to that small group. No, I'm gonna go to that church. No, they got that recovery ministry. I'm gonna go there. And you start replacing it with new ones. Those old ones eventually fall out. And then it wants to take you to the new addresses. Let's go, it's Tuesday, let's go to Breakaway. It's Sunday, let's go to church. It's Wednesday, let's go to small group. That's how your heart works. You replace the old with the new. Fill it with the things of God. 